Movies like Miller's Girl are why I no longer apply ratings to movies I review. When I was a teenager and a young adult, self-styled film critic full of pretension and self-importance, thank God I grew out of that, eh? I would emulate my idols in the field like Roger Ebert and write reviews where I gave out star ratings and I felt like a right proper reviewer. But what numerical rating could possibly describe the cinematic Arnold Palmer concoction equal parts sublimely terrible and terribly sublime that is Miller's Girl? The film stars Jenna Ortega as Cairo, an 18-year-old high school student in rural Tennessee, and Martin Freeman as John Miller, Cairo's English teacher. Cairo, who lives alone in a mansion, her parents are lawyers who Cairo describes as permanently abroad, fancies herself a writer and is instantly attracted to Miller, who is also a writer, albeit an uncelebrated one. Cairo and John embark on the sort of forbidden flirtation that students and teachers have in movies like this. The student impresses the teacher with how well-read she is. They escalate to quoting each other's writing in reverent tones. Soon they're talking outside of class, smoking together, attending a poetry reading together. Then comes the fateful day when Cairo leaves her phone behind in John's classroom, and he has to deliver it to her at her house in the rain. A plot summary doesn't do this movie justice. It is, beat for beat, exactly what you would expect from a student-teacher forbidden affair story with occasional erotic thriller inclinations. Nothing happens that you wouldn't expect to happen. What elevates Miller's Girl from run-of-the-mill mediocrity to hysterical schlock is its impressive commitment to being as formulaic as possible, while featuring a cast of genuinely talented actors who seem to be trying very hard and very earnestly to make this good. I knew I was in for either a really good time or a really bad time when the movie opened with a voiceover from Cairo's character that serves no purpose other than to immediately negate any sense of mystery or curiosity I might have had about Cairo, her circumstances, or who she is. Never mind any of that stuff that might, in a good film, create interest and investment in the lead character. The movie just straight up tells me who she is, why she's in that big house all by herself, and that she's a writer who's about to develop a serious and seriously inappropriate crush on her English teacher. John's introduction comes at the end of that opening narration and features this hilarious moment where Martin Freeman has to walk down a long hallway, stop on his mark for no reason at all other than to pause and give us a chance to look at him. He plays it like John thinks he's heard something behind him, and that's why he stopped right here at this spot for a few seconds, and he almost gets away with it, but not quite. That's the defining characteristic of Martin Freeman's performance as John, doing things that can't possibly work, but trying to make them work through the sheer force of his talent. The poor guy has to act sincerely impressed by Cairo and her supposedly extraordinary genius as a writer. He has to play multiple scenes where he sits there and listens to someone read something aloud to him and get all misty-eyed over it. And to be clear, these are not readings that warrant such a response. There's a bit when John and Cairo are at a poetry reading, and John is listening to a dude read a stereotypical modern poem, a florid reflection on the pain of lost love, and we see John reacting to it like he's watching Lincoln recite the Gettysburg Address for the first time. Freeman also has to play a scene where John masturbates to a sex scene in a story Cairo has written about the two of them. Because, of course, she writes such a story. By the way, in the sex scene, the student character is reading a steamy passage from Henry Miller while the teacher character is preparing to fuck her. And it's so hot that while he's reading it, John just can't keep it in his pants. I'm sure most English teachers can relate to that. Jenna Ortega has some equivalent heavy lifting to do as Cairo, who seems to have emerged unaltered from the collective imagination of every teacher who read Lolita and took it as an aspirational work. Cairo is 18, scandalously young, but nice and legal. She's wise beyond her years, a voracious reader. She's a writer with promise, the perfect candidate for an older, more experienced man in writing to take under his wing and guide and help to flower as a writer. She's preternaturally confident, she's still a virgin, and her parents are currently in another country. 
Forget collective imagination of teachers who read Lolita aspirationally. Did Humbert Humbert somehow escape the page and write this himself? Oh, but like all such forbidden fruit, Cairo eventually shows herself to have a bitter aftertaste. Eventually, John realizes that what's happening between the two of them is wrong, and he imposes more conventional student-teacher boundaries between himself and Cairo, and Cairo responds by threatening him, sexually taunting him, and then reporting him to the school for inappropriate conduct. Oh, and she bullies her best friend into testifying in support of her charges, too, just to make sure John is doomed. Because those nymphets, man, you gotta be careful. Reject their advances and they'll turn on you. There is not a cliché this movie doesn't embrace, not a shortcut it doesn't take, not a subtlety it doesn't bulldoze in favor of the most obvious choice available. Through it all, Ortega and Freeman are trying their best to pull this crummy and ludicrous material up to their level, and even though it works much better with them than it would have without them, it's just too heavy. Ortega and Freeman aren't the only actors attempting good performances here. Bashir Salahuddin plays Boris, John's fellow teacher and best friend, with a waggish energy, and some of his exchanges with Freeman have a loose improvisational quality that make them among the few actually good parts of the film. Gideon Adlon does her best with Winnie, Cairo's best friend, an absolute mess of a character. Winnie is supposedly a lesbian, but she also has a crush on Boris, which parallels Cairo's crush on John, and which Cairo uses in an attempt to tease and entice John after he's called off their budding affair. Like Freeman and Salah Hudden, Adlon and Ortega have good chemistry together and occasionally manage the minor miracle of making their characters come across, however briefly, like plausible human beings. And in perhaps my favorite supporting performance, there's Dagmar Dominchik as John's wife Beatrice. She's introduced in her first scene by John greeting her with the line, Hello, wife! So we wouldn't get confused, I guess. And things only get worse, by which I mean better, from there. Beatrice plays like a character from a Tennessee Williams play as conceived by someone who has never seen or read a Tennessee Williams play, but only heard one described to them by a drunk who has also never seen or read a Tennessee Williams play. Beatrice is always a little drunk, always a little horny, but not horny enough to actually fuck John, because John needs to be sexually frustrated to give his attraction to Cairo some additional tension and motivation. Beatrice is more successful than John, always too busy to pay attention to John, finds it difficult to work when John is in the same room with her. She is sexy but unavailable, witty but cutting, and when the truth comes out about John and Cairo, Beatrice absolutely reads him for filth in the most exuberantly trashy scene in the film. She and John attack each other, flinging cliches like throwing knives. She charges him with egotism and mediocrity. He calls her the sea word. It's so bad, it's good cinema at its worst and best. Don't let me give you the impression this is just a reheated student-teacher affair story that brings nothing of its own to the table, however. There's also a subplot about Boris secretly baking biscuits and bringing them in for his fellow teachers, who doesn't want the students to find out he bakes biscuits because he worries it will hurt his reputation with the baseball players he coaches, who is talked by Cairo and Winnie into turning his baking into a business and selling his biscuits to raise money for the baseball team. I call it a subplot because I'm not sure what else to call it, though I'm not sure that's the proper term, since plots usually have a resolution, and Boris's biscuit subplot is the subject of several scenes in the movie, and then is just completely dropped and never mentioned again. Why is this in the movie? And since it was in the movie for some reason, where did it go? Why was it here? Why was any of this here? Miller's Girl is written and directed by Jade Halley Bartlett. I didn't know much about Bartlett before seeing this film, and after a bit of research, I find that there isn't much to know. Miller's Girl is her first film as writer and director. How it came to be made, and made with talent, the caliber of Ortega, Freeman, and their castmates with this script? is a mystery to me, but apart from that script, it is a well-made film. 
Bartlett the director does occasionally go overboard, but no more so than Bartlett the writer, so at least there's consistency. I was not surprised to learn that Bartlett originally wrote this as a play before deciding to pursue producing it as a film. Many of the scenes have a very play-like quality, which is not to say the film is stagey in a visual sense, it mostly isn't, but the writing still bears the hallmarks of having been written for the stage, where the limitations of the theater are compensated for by the liberal application of the spoken word. Does Bartlett have promise as a filmmaker? I honestly don't know. On a technical and visually artistic level, she's done good work here. She's made a film on a small budget that looks every bit the work of professionals. But this script, this script with its pretensions, its self-importance, its lack of self-awareness, its almost impressive lack of anything new to say with this material, it feels like a first draft. Not merely a first draft, but a first draft written by an 18-year-old who shows promise, but is not nearly as good as they have convinced themselves they are. Now, why does that sound familiar? So, yeah, what star rating would I possibly give this? Is it a good movie in the conventional sense? No. Did I have a good time watching it? I had a great time watching it. I smiled, I laughed, I howled with delight. I asked myself more than once, why was this made? Who is this for? Not because I wanted answers to those questions, but because I knew there can be no answers to those questions. And knowing it brought me joy. One star, four stars, four out of 10, 10 out of 10, I don't know, I don't care. Miller's Girl is currently streaming on Netflix and is available to rent on a few other platforms. If you enjoy seeing great actors slum it, if you like your movies served with a nice thick slice of cheese, if playing trope bingo and laughing at a movie instead of with it sound like a good time to you, then I highly recommend it.